Okay. Let's see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all about the lighting. Well, the light's really weird. The sunlight is pouring into this window right in my face, but then it wasn't. Yeah, this, this helps or hurts. <laughs> That's a challenge of trying different times of the day. The sun changes so much. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, well, can you see me at all or do I look really dark? You're dark, but I can see you. Okay. Move my light over here and see if that helps. Okay, diffuse the light. Okay, well, doing the best I can is sort of That's the, a little better. It kind of helps diffuses it. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, everybody, welcome back. We are back from Hollywood Kitchen. Uh, thank you guys for bearing with me. I know I had a like a month hiatus here, but multiple events I had tickets to two plus years ago all came back at the exact same time. So. For the past multiple weekends, it's been a little crazy, but in a glorious and great way. And I'm, I'm so happy. So today we are continuing our guacamole obsession at Hollywood Kitchen. And Samantha should be joining us soon, fingers crossed. Uh, Fritzy Kramer of Movies Silently um, had a mishap involving her foot and she cannot be here today, but I'm hoping she can join us in the future. And the great Jenny Hamilton of Silver Screen Suppers sent us cooking notes because she is in London and it is very late at night in London. But I am so delighted to welcome back to Hollywood Kitchen the great Angie Schneider. Angie is a delightful lady. She is a film history expert. She is a collector. She is involved with Hollywood heritage. And I'm so happy to have you here today, Angie. Thank you for having me again. Thank you. So we're going to talk about the first bracket we did was the old dark house involving Boris Karloff's guac recipe versus Gloria Stewart's. And in that particular case, it was a Boris Karloff victory hands down. And the old dark house was kind of the uniting theme of the, the bracket organization, which Samantha is the person who came up with all the brackets. So credit goes to her for that. Today's bracket theme is MGM. And we'll talk a little bit about both of the stars, but we're going to talk a lot about the culture of MGM and being at a Hollywood studio. So we've got the Debbie Reynolds guacamole recipe, which I found in a copy of a classic movie magazine from 19, I think it's about 55 or so. And it's titled Debbie's Surprise Recipes for Eddie. So there's a lot to unpack there just by that title alone. And the other recipe, Greer Carson's, is from the book, Paul Dini's Celebrity Cookbook. And it's also been reprinted as some of you might've known in the Dead Celebrity Cookbook. So that recipe pops up a bit too. So Angie, how did you first, like, I always ask people this, like, how did you first kind of encounter both Greer Garson and Debbie Reynolds? How did you first kind of discover their work? Um, I mean, Debbie Reynolds, for obvious reasons, you know, I mean, you can't think of classic films and you can't think of singing in the rain. Um, but then I also think, you know, as a collector myself, she's kind of our hero. Um, you know, so I think when I first had moved to Los Angeles right at the time, she was having her auction. So I remember going, um, when she had her dance studio up there in North Hollywood, going and looking at her, one of her auctions and when she had the exhibit. Um, so it was kind of a, uh, you saw the new Debbie versus the Carrie Fisher mom or the Singing in the Rain Debbie. You see the preservationist Debbie, which, you know, I think in her good fortune, I, I think that's really what she's become known for, you know, in, in modern times, which I think is great. Yes, that is a good thing because, I mean, one thing that's always frustrated me, and I'm sure you and probably lots of people watching too, is the lack of regard that our town has had for its own history. I mean, this is a business that, and this frustrates me, they, they don't, they have a really short memory. Like when I used to work at a Hollywood studio, people would laugh and make fun of me because I cared about classic film. Like if it was made post 1980 is what people knew. <laughs> and I was the person that a lot of times people would go, go down the hall, ask Carrie about that. <laughs> it's just sort of like, but, everybody should love this stuff. I mean, this is what made me fall in love with the movies. We're old movies. I just couldn't believe. In fact, I, I used to work at Miramax and several of my coworkers did not know 
who Howard Hughes, Catherine Hepburn, or Ava Gardner were, and I actually locked them in my boss's office and made them watch a documentary. It's true, I did. Oh, Samantha's joining us. Hang on. Oh, yay. perfect. Samantha! Hey! Hi! So happy to have you here and happy for you and Angie to meet. And we were just talking um, about Debbie Reynolds and her preservation work. And I was just ranting for a moment about having worked at studios, how little of a memory or even a curiosity people have for older films. And I think what Debbie did that was so heroic is she was saving the stuff when nobody else cared. I mean, when the stuff was just treated like it didn't matter at all, she was she was trying to save it, buy it up and do something. So she definitely realized that this stuff had importance for future generations. And that's a major thing to her credit. Yeah, she was so ahead of her time. And I actually had the pleasure of talking to Todd Fisher on the Ticklish Business podcast last month. And it was just so incredible, all of the pieces that he had that, that she owned. And we were talking to him on Zoom and we would bring up a movie. We were talking about our top three favorite Debbie Reynolds movies. And he would hold up a dress from that movie or her copy of the script while we were talking to him. And I just got so nervous and excited. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. So we were, I was asking Angie kind of how she first encountered Debbie Reynolds and Greer Garson. And Debbie is kind of, if for anyone that loves Hollywood history, Debbie's kind of the 101. She's one of the first names that pops up and Singing in the Rain is one of the first movies that for a lot of people pops up as well. How about you, Samantha? Um, what was your first introduction to either one of these great women? Well, see, I want to jump in and say Singing in the Rain because that was the first classic film that I ever saw that really, of course, made me fall in love with classic movies. That's kind of a lot of people's gateway drug into classic movies. But if I'm telling the truth, I didn't even think about it until I was on the, the podcast with Kristen. And she said Charlotte's Web. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I saw Charlotte's Web as a kid and she did the voice of Charlotte. So that was really my first experience with her but I am a diehard Debbie Reynolds fan she's absolutely one of my favorites I have a plan she wrote me uh, a few days or a few months before she passed away and I have a plan to get um part of her handwriting tattooed on me so that's how intense of a Debbie fan I am wow very cool but I've never made her guacamole recipe so this is a first for me I was talking about where we found these and the Greer Garson one it's been reprinted in the dead celebrity cookbook but it's also in Paul Denis celebrity cookbook which I think is from the early 50s and then Debbie's recipe I found this in a classic film magazine and I love the title Debbie's surprise recipes for Eddie so I, there's a whole list of different recipes in this magazine too. And I printed up the guacamole one. So that's, that's where I found it. And in doing my own little research for this episode, it's kind of astounding how ubiquitous Debbie was in the movie magazines. I mean, she is like, you cannot not run into her constantly, especially during the Eddie, Debbie, Liz trifecta of scandal, which we'll, we'll talk about, I'm sure. But in terms of Greer Garson, like how are you guys Greer Garson fans? How did you first encounter Greer Garson? I mean, mine would be, I mean, she's kind of your technicolor of the redhead, you know? So I mean, when you kind of are thinking of a big redhead actress, especially in the MGM lot, you know, you think of Greer Garson. And I think, um, you know, when we kind of show through some of my stuff, I have a lot of the uh, lines roars that they use for exhibition purposes and I mean the number of covers that they did of her you know she was really getting some of the great you know um roles there for a while and you know she's more serious but she was that redhead that you think of technicolor wise <laughs> you know I notice is oh it seems and correct me if I'm wrong on this but it seems almost every five to ten years there's a new archetype that replaces the old archetype at a studio. For example, Norma Shearer was like the first lady of MGM, the dramatic, regal, prestige actress starring in all the top dramas. And then it seemed like at the end of the 30s, early 40s, that became Greer Garson instead of Norma Shearer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Kind of like how Lana Turner took over the Gene Harlow role. And 
So uh, to me, it seems like Brewer Garson was kind of that in that Norma Shearer mold. So. Very theatrical also in their performances, I will say. And of course, multi Oscar nominated, both of them. Um, I love that comparison because I love, uh, I adore Norma Shearer, but Greer Garson for me, it's more her roles that I kind of came accustomed to her through rather than, oh, I want to go watch a Greer Garson movie. It's, oh, I want to watch Pride and Prejudice and Greer Garson's in it and Random Harvest. I, I think that's definitely my favorite film of hers for sure. I will say I'm not as big of a fan of hers as a lot of old Hollywood fans are because I've met some old Hollywood fans that adore Greer. They're, she's like the all-time favorite in a lot of circles, but but I do really enjoy her work. I feel like it's like if you go, if you want to go see her type of performance, it was very theatrical. It's almost like just going to see a play versus you're watching it on TV, you know? So sometimes it's like, well, I could sit and watch a Greer Garson movie or go to see a play, you know, it's that same. But it wasn't there even a competition there for between her and Joan Crawford, more or less, I think, for some of those roles I believe some have said too, because when Joan really wanted to get those serious roles, I think at that time, a lot of them were going to Greer Garson. They're completely different types of people that you would even compare, you know? Well, I always heard that um, Norma Shearer was offered Mrs. Miniver and she didn't want to play the mother to older children, which at that time, in fairness, would have been kind of a death knell to a lot of actresses because they're sort of slapped with the older mother label but I heard that Norma turned it down and thus Greer got the part do you guys know if there's any truth to that I believe I have heard that I mean Norma was offered a lot of different roles Uh, I think the most famous one being Sunset Boulevard which she turned down so I I think I've heard that specific one whether it's true or not I'm not sure but it makes sense I could, I'd have to get my friend Darren on the phone, my Norma Shearer expert friend. Exactly. He's an encyclopedia of Norma, so I should, I should reach out to him to confirm that. So I um, just, I did not have time to make the walks in advance. Part of the reason the show's so late today, I had to do work for my other job, and then I had to go give a cemetery tour before coming home. So my day's been kind of nuts. Um, but I'm going to make it on camera. Angie is too. Samantha, did you make the walks or... Uh, So I have finished the Debbie Guac. I got kind of um, short on time. So my wonderful boyfriend is making the Greer Guac as we speak. He will hand it to me on camera. (laughs) So then I'll have both. Why don't we make the Guacs and we'll, um, I'll walk us through making the Guacs. We'll eat the Guacs and discuss, and then we can get back to discussing, you know, both of these women and really MGM itself, which is kind of the, the uniting thread, kind of like the movie The Old Dark House was last time. Let's start with Greer's walk, because there are some differences when each, which each of these recipes a little bit. So Greer's walk, that sounds fun. <laughs> um, okay, it says Mexican guacamole. I'm going to make a smaller version, because it's just me, a uh, small tomato, all right, small onion, when it says red pepper, I did not know if she meant a red chili pepper or crushed red pepper. So I went ahead and got some crushed red pepper. And I went with the chili pepper. Um, again, just kind of sticking to the Mexican theme. You know, you think of all the peppers that they <laughs> they have. But so we'll kind of compare the difference since we each did one differently. Yeah, and six avocados is a lot. So I'm making this like with one for me. Um, I don't have shredded lettuce. Forgive me, Greer. I'm skipping that one. When it's I think it's just one, garnish anyway. <laughs> when it says one teaspoon of salad oil, do they mean just olive oil? Yeah, like a vegetable oil. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two tablespoons of mayonnaise. Now, we have come upon the mayonnaise issue before. This has come up. And it would, had very mixed results in the Halloween Smackdown. So we're going to revisit that topic. Uh, lemon juice. Two teaspoons of lemon juice, two and a half teaspoons of salt, four drops of Tabasco. <laughs> All right, this is going to make it feeling hard. It's going to be spicier. <laughs> this one's going to be real spicy. So, all right, I'm going to start assembling mine. And since I'm just making it for one, I'm going to kind of eyeball the portions a little bit. If that well, is I, okay. I think if you think of that time versus now, produce is so much smaller. You know, we genetically altered our produce to be big and <laughs> 
fill a whole family. So I, I think like even the onion, when they say one small onion, you know, I don't even think we have that size onions. And I think their avocados are probably much smaller back then too. Oh, definitely. I find that cooking with these vintage recipes is a lot of detective work in a lot of ways. Okay, red pepper, shredded lettuce, okay. salad oil. Hmm. I'm just gonna put a little olive oil on here. Uh, mayonnaise. I'm gonna, just going to put one tablespoon and not two. Small one of that. Mayonnaise. Okay. Lemon juice, salt, and Tabasco. And Jenny, uh, Silver Screen suffers, by the way, Samantha, she can't be here due to the time difference. But she sent me notes, so I'm going to read her notes. And Fritzy injured her foot, by the way. So poor Fritzy can't be here at the moment. But okay, so I put all of these in a bowl. I'm going to stir it up really well here. It makes it a lot creamier, but mayonnaise and guac really is kind of a hard thing. I wonder if that's why she's got the shredded lettuce in her recipe too, since it is almost, she adds like a dressing, you know, a salad dressing sauce into it. Yeah. You see, last fall when we made Vincent Price's um, guacamole, his has mayonnaise in it too. And there were some people when we did our little thing, our virtual Halloween party, that were like, oh, it makes it so creamy. It gives it great texture. And then 50% of people were like, okay, that's disgusting. No. So there was a varied response to that concept for sure. They used mayo and everything back then. They were mayonnaise happy back then. That is awfully true. I will say I have made the Greer Garson one before. I had a Greer Garson versus Ramon Navarro bracket that I did way back in 2019 for the Super Bowl. And I am on the bandwagon of mayo improving it, honestly. I think it does add a bit of creaminess, which is like really unique actually, but otherwise it's a pretty traditional recipe, I feel like. Okay. And I, I have not done the Ramon Navarro myself, but I have read your post about it. And what I think is interesting was in Ramon Navarro's block, by the way, I also went into a star for those watching, um, he has pomegranate seeds in it, right? Wasn't that the pomegranate seed one? Or was it grapes? So I think there's a couple variants. I've seen people use pomegranate seeds, but I used green grapes and, and it is a revelation. It is yeah. so good. Because see, I know a Ramon Navarro collector and I've been trying to get him to do an episode. It's just a scheduling issue, but I thought about making several Ramon Navarro things and just saving him for like a standalone kind of thing. But um, I think that's a great idea. He's definitely someone who needs to be talked about more. Yeah, and this friend has like some really impressive Ramon Navarro things. So I'm like, well, that's why I thought Debbie and Greer would be a better kind of situation here. But, okay, so here is the Greer Garson guacamole. I think the mayonnaise definitely gives it a much paler green than color. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you have yours ready, Samantha? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> I will give my verdict though. Okay, and now. The Debbie Reynolds guacamole, I found this recipe, as I mentioned, in a fan magazine with a whole spread about all the food Debbie cooks to surprise Eddie. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Wild story. Okay, so two ripe avocados. I'm using one. Okay, an onion diced. By the way, do you, are you guys good at dicing? Because I seriously, I wish I could take a class in dicing because I need skills in this department i personally enjoy it i think the real thing that changed it for me was when i started using a bigger knife like if you okay. use a, a really big knife and you use the weight of the knife to mash i think it, it gets pretty huh. fine it, yeah okay. yeah it could be a right the right knife and the right tool and it makes it exactly easier. makes it easier i just have a tiny little knife but it's like a whole thing you know so how did you do your tomatoes did you boil them to peel the skin I personally didn't no I I love the whole flavor of Roma tomatoes that's what I use mm -hmm. and too. I think yeah. they're great with the peel I'll just use the the regular two 
And so lemon juice, okay, green chili peppers, that's the difference between Greer and Debbie's for sure. And I got some canned hacked green chilies here. I'm gonna put these in here. So this is gonna be spicy in a different way. Okay, now one teaspoon each of olive oil, vinegar, salt, and pepper. Okay, the vinegar is kind of confusing to me, but I'm gonna go for it because Debbie says to do it, so. I was confused about that too, but I looked it up and apparently vinegar is supposed to like add a little bit of brightness to the creaminess of the avocado. Okay. All right. Let me see here. I would like to add some. All right. And then I will add the salt and pepper. Now, I want to read what Jenny Hamilton of Silver Screen Supper said. She was kind enough to send us some notes on her thoughts on both of these recipes. Okay. All right. Here's my verdict on guac brack too. Jenny says, I liked both of these guacamoles. Love the creamy texture of Greer's, thanks to the mayonnaise. But Debbie's was the winner for me, as I loved the vinegar notes. Just more of a taste sensation, I thought. I didn't use anywhere near as much salt as Greer says, due to a friend mentioning she tried it and it was very, very salty. I might actually do Debbie's full Mexican menu sometimes. Oh my God, Debbie Reynolds Fiesta. That needs to happen, guys. All right, gotta make that happen. Um, the other two recipes sound pretty good. And I imagine she did cook a surprise dinner for Debbie. Have fun tonight. I'll watch some time soon. Okay. So thank you, Jenny, for that. And um, so, yes, I, I love Debbie Reynolds. We will talk more about her in just a moment. Um, so far, okay, so I have mixed her guac here. It's definitely a lot chunkier, perhaps due to the, um, the tomatoes and also the lack of lack of mayonnaise, but here's how mine turned out. I don't know if you can even see this in my, my weirdly lit kitchen right now. Yeah, that's a pretty good view. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna go ahead and get a few chips and start making a decision here about which one is uh, gonna work for me. I'm using my mocha head day. Hopefully, you know, the more you use these, the more they start to hold the flavor, especially in your guac cases where you keep doing so many more guac. You know, it just keeps building flavor and flavor every time you use it. What is that bowl? It's a mocha head day. So it's what you use like um, for Mexican restaurants when you do like salsa and guacamole. Um, it's just a volcano rock bowl. So after you go through the curing process, you know, you never want to use soap on it. You always just kind of keep rinsing it. But then um, every time you use it, it holds the pepper flavors, the garlic flavors, and naturally oh. enhances the flavors of your... I food. need one of those. I do not have one. Ooh. That's beautiful. Yeah, where do you find that? Is that like you can find I, it? I need it on Amazon. I got mine at Vallarta. You know, those that are in the LA area. I mean, Vallarta, I get so much of my cooking stuff. <laughs> what would it be called on oh, Amazon? Like a volcano? Um, it's called a mocha hete or even, um, I guess you could call like a Mexican mortar and pestle even too. Huh. Um, be darned. All right, here goes nothing. I'm going to try Debbie's. Drum roll, please. Hmm. Hmm. I also wondered what she was thinking when she put tostaditos. You know, was she thinking tostadas or just like a rounder tortilla chip? I didn't quite know what she meant by that. Me either. I just got white corn chips. Yeah, I I believe it's supposed to be somewhere between like a sopa and a tortilla chip, like a round one. They're, they look very thin, but it looks like you're supposed to like fry them. And I don't think any of us have time for that. So I just got some like home, well, not homemade. I didn't make them, but the, they were in-house made tortilla yeah. chips and they, they turned okay, out really good. All right, here's Greer's. Greer's yeah. um, is okay. The creamy 
texture is good, but I think I am going to agree with Jenny on this one. And I think that Debbie's is a little bit more traditional, a little more chunky. And um, I think Debbie's is ultimately the victor for me. Angie, what do you think? I like Debbie's too, because it's more traditional. Hmm. I have to admit, so I'm going to use my memory as a comparison because um, I made the Greer also. I would say that I actually like the Greer better. Yeah, it's all right. I like the, I like the creamy texture and I like the um, the fact that avocado is really the star of it. And I think with Debbie's, her ratios are just a little off for me. You know what I mean? I think like there's a lot of vinegar. It's very tomato forward. I don't know if you guys saw but um, yeah, there's a lot of tomato going on just for the small amount of avocado that you have in there. When it comes to portions, like I said, since I'm always cooking for one, sometimes I, I oftentimes I cut down the recipes a lot and sometimes I'll just eyeball it if it's a guacamole, you know what I mean? But, hmm. Hmm? Chris is quietly trying them off to yeah. the side here. <laughs> Thank you. But I don't think have the real one, one and I'm still in their lives. So I think when this whole bracket is said and done, I will have made and or tasted every single celebrity guac recipe I can get my hands on. So that's ultimately the end game here, folks. I think it's thought somebody made that comment when you advertise this. They're like, so much uh, guacamole. But you know what I really think it is? I mean, if you think of 40s and 50s, Southern California. I mean, they had so many more trees of fruit trees and avocados everywhere that probably just such an easy staple to, to make and just pick right out of your yard. <laughs> yeah. And then El Coyote is a famous uh, Mexican restaurant here. It's been here since the thirties. So it would kind of make sense if there was this huge wave of interest in uh, Mexican food mm -hmm. at the time. Absolutely. I think it's also just a crowd pleaser. So yeah, I feel like that I, definitely makes sense. I know I've done a lot of guac on Hollywood Kitchen, but I, I apologize for nothing because <laughs> it's fun to make, it's easy to make, it's a crowd pleaser, you can use it for football games, Oscar parties, whatever. I Sometimes I like to use guacamole as a spread, like I'll make a sandwich oh, yeah. and then just spread it on the sandwich. It's funny being an Angelino because here, I don't know about where you live, Samantha, but here in California, we tend to put uh, avocado or guac on everything. Yes. Well, I was born in California, so I live in Pennsylvania now, but I definitely miss the California style of food. And I also still to this day put avocado on everything. So I totally really understand that one. My family lives in Georgia. And so every time I go home to Georgia, I order stuff. And I go, oh, oh, add avocado to that. And my mom's like, Carrie, that is not a thing down here. Okay. She would think I was up to tell me that because I always assume, oh, just throw some avocado. And it's like, that's just not common there. So. I literally, it, I, I get the weirdest looks. My go-to hot dog is guacamole, uh, shredded cheese, and lime juice. That's what I want on my hot dog. <laughs> and wow. and it's such a Californian thing, and people look at me so funny. <laughs> well, we're spoiled living here, because honestly, you can get delicious guacamole and avocados almost year-round. and. Oh. I feel so lucky. I don't know if you guys, like, if you ever get the chance to, like, go to a place where the food is so different, and then you get back home, and you crave, like, the California stuff, mm -hmm. because I definitely do. Like, if I could gone somewhere for a while or a week or two, whatever, that doesn't have it, then when I get back, I'm like, oh, you know. You know <laughs> exactly. Like, Not the fresh produce. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Well, um, getting back to Debbie Reynolds, by the way, because there's so much to talk about with her and specifically. Um, she kind of had, I first saw her in Singing in the Rain, as a lot of people did. That's kind of probably the film she's most famous for. But also, um, I've seen a lot of her other films, including The Unsinkable Molly Brown. That was the one she was Oscar nominated for. And Debbie was um, a wonderful talent, a really smart, bright woman. And also, she, as we said, kind of got drugged into this mouse room because she married Eddie Fisher. They had Carrie Fisher, who would become Princess Leia, of course, in Star Wars, and Todd Fisher. And then I found them so all over the fan magazines. And then, of course, 
Mike Todd, Elizabeth Taylor's husband, was killed in this terrible plane crash. And then Liz turned to comfort in the arms of Eddie, who was married to Debbie at the time. And it kind of exploded in like this big scandal. It was this Eddie, Debbie, Liz. And then they got a divorce. And so Liz is painted in many cases like this home record. She breaks up the marriage. And then of course there's lots of kids involved in all this too, which is normally not always mentioned. And then she marries Eddie Fisher, Elizabeth Taylor does, but then she goes to Rome and gets together with Richard Burton. So then scandal number two, when of course, you know, Elizabeth Taylor divorces Eddie and marries Richard. So it was kind of this huge thing at the time. And I'm sure it, it looked really bad because he's cheating on America's sweetheart. And so many people love Debbie that it's kind of understandable why the fan magazines were just a nonstop parade of this, this case going on throughout the era. And I don't know, what do you guys make of the whole Eddie Debbie Liz thing? Because it certainly would have been like a hashtag or all over social media had that been available at the time. I think it's a little bit hard for me because both Debbie and Elizabeth are easily in my top 10 favorites. So I, I can't like choose a side. They, I feel like they both did what they thought was right in the situation. And it's definitely tough. I totally understand why the media had a frenzy with it. I mean, it was so typical of the 50s and the time to cast Elizabeth aside as this, you know, evil and seductive woman. Um, and and great hair, which is always... <laughs> exactly. And they paint Debbie as a sweetheart and nobody talks about Eddie and what he's doing wrong in the situation because he's a man. Yeah. <laughs> It definitely was, it was huge at the time. Well, Every the funny, fan magazine. The funny thing was, and I love the story, I heard that years later they totally made up. Like it happened to be mm -hmm. they were on like Liz and Debbie were on a cruise ship together and they wound up having dinner and getting along great and were friends. I'm like, yay, I love that story. I love that Eddie's in the dust and these two women are friends and all is, all is good thereafter. So. What brought them together was they were able to just sit and complain to him finally with them out of the picture. <laughs> like, yeah, both okay. of them were like, what were you, what were you thinking? <laughs> Two, we live in a world where the media likes to build people up or build images up. And then even more so, it likes to tear them apart. You know, and there's almost like this sad kind of glee that you read in articles sometimes about that. And you think these aren't just, you know, stars. These are human beings with feelings and families and kids and lots of people involved. And it's like, how would that feel to them to be in the center of something like that? I mean, I don't know. I mean, people think it'd be so great to be famous, but I think it would be a very rough thing psychologically for a lot of people. Right. I mean, the paparazzi essentially, to a huge extent, was invented in the 60s for the Elizabeth Taylor Richard Burton scandal. So I can't imagine someone being so in the public eye that this whole, you know, horrible thing of the media hunting down celebrities just for a picture is a thing because of her and because of that whole situation, really. It's crazy. So in terms of the movies, like what would you say your favorite Debbie Reynolds film is? And what would you say your favorite Greer Garson film is? I'll start with you, Angie, and then Samantha. Um, believe it or not, I think for Debbie, my favorite's probably not everybody's favorite, but I love Bundle of Joy. I think that was just so entertaining. Like even, even as a person that likes to cook out of old vintage books like the part where she's trying to learn how to raise a baby and the pages get stuck you know I mean how's that not happen to all of us at some point and you know reading two different um, instructions but you know and then again that kind of goes back to that Eddie and you just kind of you did see a little bit of a, a real connection there which was a shame but um, yeah I think of course you know seeing the rain is a, a close second but you know whenever bundle of joy it's just one of those feel good comfort movies that I like of hers. And, and then Greer, I would say Miss Miniver, you know, kind of go with the natural favorite of everybody's. Samantha? For Debbie, it's so impossible because I love her so much and I've seen as many of her movies as I can get my hands on. We are doing I, a fiesta. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. I love it. Honestly, for Debbie, I, I really do have to go back to Singing in the Rain. I think Bundle of Joy is right up there for me too, actually. 
Um, I love her in the mating game. And then one that's super underrated that I always have to mention when I'm talking about Debbie Reynolds films is The Rat Race. It's from 1960 with Tony Curtis. It is brutally sad, but it's really, really good. And then as far as Greer, I would say really my big two would be uh, Random Harvest and Pride and Prejudice. But I also really like her in Madame Curie. Mm. And she had a really great string of films for quite a while. Absolutely. She, she carried the 40s to a, to a certain extent. Absolutely. I think I'm going to agree with both of you guys. I think for me, these are obvious answers, but what the heck? I can't help it. Um, yeah, Singing in the Rain. I just fell in love with that movie because as someone who loves silent film, but I also love musicals and there's just so many things that film like appeal that, that appealed to me about that movie. So I love Singing in the Rain and also Mrs. Menever. Those are those are obvious choices, but frankly, I don't care. And they're great. <laughs> so whatever. They're great films. So Angie, I would love to see some of your MGM collection if you would like to share some stuff with us. Sure, because that might kind of get conversations going. Um, I did want to pull, this is just, I had this on my desk because I was working on another project, but bringing up again, Debbie Reynolds and being so ahead of preservation. Um, I had the original groundbreaking program for when they were supposed to have the Hollywood Museum in 1963. So you have to think this is pre-MGM auction and this is, you know, Mary Pickford, a lot of the actors at that time really pushed to have a museum at that moment. So they went as far as having a groundbreaking. Those that don't, aren't familiar with it, it was actually where Hollywood Heritage is now, where the barn is across from Hollywood Bowl, is where that was supposed to be. So they had demolished all the French Village, all the homes in that parking lot um, to make it. And they went as far as having the groundbreaking, but it never happened. But when I was paging through it yesterday, um, one of the founders was actually Debbie Reynolds as well. She was one of the early, so I mean, it was in her blood even as early as 1963 that she really wanted to see, you know, so maybe that is what stirred up interest, maybe when this went nowhere and then, you know, you know, a decade later you had the MGM auction and maybe that kind of stirred things up. So I, I just said that was kind of interesting. I wanted to bring that out because, you know, she was really ahead of her time on that as well. Um, my favorite of the MGM stuff I have um, is they had um, a publication called Lion's Roar. And Lion's Roar is what was distributed both in-house as well as for exhibitors. And they had the beautiful artwork, as you kind of recognize here. Oh, that's gorgeous. And that. um, this is the entire <laughs> catalog of all the lines roars. Oh, um, so a lot of them are bounded. I have to get them rebounded um, at some point. Um, but you know, most of them are done by um, Jack um, over um, Caprolick. You know, a lot of his artwork is on them. But um, so I did kind of page through. Like I said, that's one thing that you knew MGM put a lot in Greer because I mean, there's four different covers or four different editions that they had her on the cover. Let's see, Let's see this. And how, oh my gosh. How often do these come out, Angie, these Lions War? Um, they were monthly up until I want to say 48. Don't hold so me on what that. What year did they start? Um, I think late 30s. Oh, it's been a while since I've looked and got the exact dates, but pre Debbie Reynolds, because there's no Debbie Reynolds, you know, this, this ended before she did. Um, but then like, here's another one for Miss Miniver. That's beautiful. Um, I love the artwork. Who's the artist again? Um, this is Jack uh, Caprolecki. I think that's how you pronounce it, Jack Caprolecki. It's like Jacques, kind of French. Um, but he was, he started with Paramount initially. Um, as an artist and caricature. Um, and then he went on and did most of the MGM stuff. So he also went as far as like when you watch movies, you'll see some of his artwork and some of the, you know, initial credits and title scenes and things like that. Um, I think this one's got a Greer in it as well. There's another Greer. Wow. Sorry, my lighting's not probably the greatest, but 
Um, so yeah, they definitely put the art into her. Cause I mean, for him to do one, I think it took him, there might be more of an expert out there on his artwork, but I mean, it took him probably a good, you know, a couple months to do one art. And yeah, there's quite a few Greer in there, which makes me think MGM really kind of put her, you know, up at the top there. But these are fun because um, there was something else that a lot of the studios did in that time, which were campaign books. You know, and the campaign books were to promote a lot of the upcoming movies. Some of them were beautiful, like the RKO ones were gorgeous. We have a few of those. And what's always fun is sometimes these movies didn't go anywhere. They promoted it, but then they pulled it. Um, so sometimes you go through these old lion roars, you know, and you read about what they're trying to promote that new actress and how they, they talk them up. Sometimes the titles of the movies change. Sometimes the movie never happened, but they went as far as promoting it anyway. So it, they really are kind of a vast, you know, resource for information. And, you know, they're just kind of fun to kind of page through. Um, Chris, do you know what years they went? Um, I think our first ones are around 1940. Oh, it's what, 48? Um, yeah, because we have them all over here. I got them all over here now. But yeah, I mean, like here's one with Judy. Oh, and this one when they're promoting Ziegfeld Follies, Lucille Ball. So yeah, I mean they were they were gorgeous, but um, that's one of my favorite of my MGM stuff, which kind of really got things going. But they continued that artwork in just about everything. Like this was from the Hollywood Reporter, so even if it's not something from their um, publication, but that's when Jean Harlow died and they did their advertisement, you know, same thing. They had that cartoony type of artwork. Um, here's for their 10th anniversary when they would be getting their sponsors. So it was a Prey to Stars. Um, and again, they just did just amazing work promoting a lot of their movies at that time. So these are just so much fun to just kind of be able to go through and, um, no, so that's probably one of my favorite pieces because it is just so valuable. It's just so fun to, to page through. Like I said, it's on our list of conservation work to get them rebounded. Um, but other little things I pulled out. Um, oh, speaking of campaign books, like I said, MGMs I never found to be quite as elaborate as like um, William Fox or Kale early on. But this one was in 1931, they did a whole campaign book just on their shorts. And you have everything from our gang in there. Um, here, Carrie, you like this one, the Dogville comedies. You know, you know, things that just never really partitioned out to anything. There's a pretty our gang advertisement. This one, you know, it's amazing quality and it just, it has like a fuzzy feel and I love it. The way I found this one, believe it or not, was at an estate sale in the pile of kids books. And yet it was an MGM campaign book, just because, again, they're so cartoony that I guess if you just didn't know better, you'd probably think that they were a children's book. <laughs> I really wish I had more time to do estate sales. I know. I find them like gold. It's so fun. And you can you can look through so much crap. And then when you find something that's amazing, the adrenaline mm -hmm. rush, at least for me, is like, oh, my gosh, you know, you just like freak out thinking, I can't believe I found, you know, whatever yeah. I think it was. The Frank and the Debbie, one of the last things regarding Beard Garson that I pulled out. I try to go around the house and pull things. I, I'm sure I'm probably forgetting things I would love to show and I'll think of it afterwards. But um, this was one of the menus from MGM, from the commissary. And this was 1950. And it's, so I've gotten these before. They're fun because sometimes this would have been a person visiting. So they actually wrote their whole itinerary on the back of the menu so it, like lists all the stars that they met you know they met Jane Powell, Spencer Tracy, Stuart Granger, um, let's see who else, Howard Keel. Um, so it's really kind of fun to kind of read their whole itinerary pretty much but what's interesting because this is 19 yeah this was November 14th 1950 and at the bottom, it actually is promoting uh, Miss Miniver and kind of explaining the situation with the war. So it says, due to wartime contingencies, Miss Miniver was made completely at the stu uh, studio here in Culver City. However, so accurate were in English backgrounds and settings that many observers mistakenly believe the 1942 Academy Award winner had been filmed abroad. The air and thinking in a 
uh, abbreviated in the Miniverse story dramatic uh, new sequel, which made entirely in England. Uh, Greer Garson and Walter Pidgeon had the starring cast of the film, not Lowe's um, state and the Egyptian theaters. Um, so it's just kind of fun that they even bring up the war aspect and why, you know, they probably would have filmed it abroad, but they couldn't, they had to stay right in the studio. But um, I thought that was kind of an interesting piece of pull out since we're talking about her today. Um, getting into Debbie a little bit. Um, well, I'll pull out some other generic stuff. I, like I said, I was trying to randomly think of things to pull out. So um, these are always fun. They pop up now and then, but these are probably from the 30s, 40s of the MGM paperweights. And there were actually two different ones that were made. Um, one says the greatest star, um, let's see, the greatest star on the screen. So again, kind of relating to Leo the lion. And then this one is um, your lucky star. So they have them kind of engraved to kind of talk about the old line. So these are always kind of fun when they pop up, um, but they were just kind of the paperweights that would have been handed out at the office. Oh, wow. I always love the photo of Greta Garbo sitting next to Leo the lion and she's like this. <laughs> I always think that's so funny. I think that's why we always had a love for MGM, you know, because again, we started collecting when we moved to Los Angeles thinking if we had a veterinary hospital here, it would be animal Hollywood themed. You know, so a lot of our early collection stuff is everything that had any of the famous animal actors, things like that. And MGM really fell into that because of Leo the Lion. So, I mean, we have a lot of lion specific pieces because of MGM and it just goes crazy from there. <laughs> this, now, for those of you who don't know, Angie and her husband are also veterinarians. <laughs> so, yes. Um, this was in 1930. So again, they did a lot of exhibi uh, exhibition things. This would have been for a golf award. Um, so it says Metro Goldwyn Mayor um, Fox West Coast Division Trophy Convention Tournament, um, Hillcrest Country Club, May 30th, 1931 by Harry Bourne. Um, but it's just, again, it's got the earlier MGM logo on there and it's just kind of a fun little decorative shelf piece. <laughs> And then um, going into Debbie, you know, like I said, she started really her big collecting in um, when the MGM had their auction. So this is actually the complete set of the auction catalogs in the original mailer. So it's got the, the paddle in there, but then the person who had gone to the auction kept everything, even the extra um, supplements that were given out the day of. You know, so this is always, I think any collector really should kind of have these because sometimes you do come across costumes or might just have that MGM label in. And oftentimes people will tell you, oh, it definitely came from the MGM auction. And it's always kind of an important resource to be able to, to go through, you know, and they broke it down to Roman. They broke it down to the different themes, you know, the furniture. It, it really is kind of fun to page through and it's a step back in time. And, you know, again, that's where like Debbie got a lot of her stuff. And some things she did put um, notes with her items. So a lot of um, things that we do have pertain to Debbie isn't really her personal stuff. It's just stuff that she collected later to auction. So like, for example, we have um, Mary Pickford's bed doll and she had written this note that stayed with the doll. And she put this doll belonged to Mary Pickford. She kept in her bedroom and slept with it until she died. Um, Love Debbie, November 5th, 2002. Yeah, and, and she kind of kept that with the doll, which I thought was adorable. So I, she really did care and, you know, took ownership of these pieces quite a bit. Um, what else do I have? Oh, what the poster behind me. <laughs> oh, what was that? What year was the original MGM auction? Was that in the 70s? Yeah, so that was um, 79, I believe. Someone might correct me, but I'm pretty sure it was 79. Okay. And then like it was in June, so you get the June 24th date on there. And, um, but yeah, the poster behind me is actually at MGM. It's got the really early, um, Metro logo on there. So this is um, Flesh of the Devil with um, Gilbert and um, Greta Garbo. And this is the French Grand. And what's interesting about this one, and usually I'm not a fan of some of the MGM posters. I mean, they're never as beautiful as like the 20th Century Fox or anything. Getting to your early silent ones, they did do a beautiful job. And their foreign ones are actually even better. Oh, I love the Swedish ones. Yeah, so this is a French Grand. Um, and what was interesting about it, it's a, I'm trying to tilt it so you can see. 
Um, but Greta Garbo's name is the main one on there. Um, the US poster, she's written very small. It's all about John Gilbert. So when they did the foreign one, it got swapped around. So Greta Garbo's the big name, and then Gilbert's got this real small little, you know, just addition. So as an aside, her time as a woman. <laughs> As an aside, my friend Mary Stanford, who's been on many of these episodes and done a lot of them with me, she and I are both huge fans of John Gilbert. And I found this John Gilbert recipe from a women's club of Beverly Hills cookbook from 1931. And so she and I got together one night and we were planning to do maybe a John Gilbert episode and we're like, let's try to make his recipe. And it was basically like raw onions and caviar on a cracker. And we each ate it. And it was so incredibly bad. We like both put it in our mouths at the same time. We we're both like spitting it out at the same time. So it was like a total disaster. So I'm still going to keep looking for an edible. It been a depression food. meal or something. It must have been something you ate during the depression. <laughs> you know, caviar though. So I mean, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. That's right. That was just onion caviar. Um, well, since I got Chris here, there's a couple bigger things. So this what was this year again? This was the 25th anniversary. 25th anniversary. So this is a big 25th anniversary photo print of them all together. And it's it's hard to see, but up front and center is actually Greer Garson. I don't know if I'm doing any good. Oh, wow. Is this the one Judy Garland was in or was she out at MGM by this time? I don't think she was in this one. I don't think she's in this one. We did multiple ones. Yeah. But yeah, Greer Garson and, and uh, Lucy and... Yeah, Lucy's up front there. Audrey Hepburn's in there. Oh, wow. I know they're all, and they're up there. Like you go online and they have like people where they can you know, match up who everybody is on them. Um, and then like I got a smaller version. This one I got from Margaret O'Brien when her husband passed away, right at the start of the pandemic, she had an estate sale and she threw a lot of her photos and possessions in there. But this was from when they did the This Is Entertainment. So I had the whole MGM cast photo on there. Um, I haven't seen this one before, so I think it was really kind of special to Margaret O'Brien. So it hangs on my office wall. And um, since Chris is here, going back to MGM posters not always be my favorite. This will be my exception. This is, I had to get this one years ago because we're also big into our showgirls. So this is the original Ziegfeld Follies one sheet. And it has just again the beautiful artwork of the showgirls. Um, oh, how yeah. cute is that? Show, but yeah. okay, so it was kind of quick run, run around the house and grab things. And kind of one more fun thing. This was Judy Garland's. Um, and I don't know if you can kind of see the MGM logo on there, but this was a, a playback. Um, record. So she would use this to reverse um, or re uh, rehearse, I should say, I Don't Care, which is a song from the Good Old Summertime. Love so, that one. Yeah. So, like, um, when you listen to it, you hear the clicks, you know, because that's how they kind of knew when they're kind of lip singing where they were at with the track and stuff like that. So, it's kind of a um, kind of a fun little piece that was Judy's that she would have rehearsed her song to and kind of did the playback to. It seems to me that, like, from what I've read, working in a Hollywood studio as a performer was a very mixed bag because there's some of them who felt like the studio gave them an education in mm -hmm. all these different areas, like horseback riding, singing, dancing, acting, etc., and kind of took care of them. But there are a lot of them who found it so constricting and wound up either suing the studio, walking out on the contracts, fighting tooth and nail. I always love Ava Gardner's quote, we're the only department store where the mannequins go home at night. There's something to that effect. So Louise Reiner was one of those too. I mean, the second, you know, you always hear kind of those stories of L.B. Mayer and the, the things he'd pull with their actresses. As soon as he tried pulling something, she's like, I'm, I'm done. I'm going on vacation. And he's like, you can't go on vacation. She's like, well, then, you know, I canceled my contract. He's like, you'll never work in this town again. She's like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, she's just, you know, just kind of put it right, put it right out there. And, and then, yes, yeah, so I'm just kind of worked the system and, and stayed with it. And that had to have been hard. I mean, because having that little agency over your career, I mean, I've been told stories about how they would have a script delivered to their house Sunday night and they had to go shoot it starting Monday morning. Mm 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like you're like, oh, let me think it over. Let me see if I want to do this. Like, no, you're doing this. You're doing that. I mean, there yeah. wasn't a lot of free will necessarily going on there. Samantha, what are your thoughts on the studio system? I would say MGM to me is kind of what the studio that I think of when I think of the studio system. They would always boast about their stars and over publicize their stars. And I think of both Greer and Debbie were no exception. Their, the way that they would go about publicizing them were a little bit different because they're sort of from different eras to me, sure. but, but very much in the public eye. And I mean, I think that both of them probably ended up being for the better for it. I think Greer, maybe she wanted to do stuff that was a little more highbrow and they gave those projects to her, which is great. I know she was under a lot of public scrutiny when she married the actor that played her son, Richard Nee. So um, she definitely had her bad moments in the spotlight too, just like Debbie, but I mean, Debbie, I think she became America's sweetheart because of the publicity. So she really owes that to her success to a, a huge degree. Well, I think she was really big in her family too. I mean, like, I think you said you got your recipe, like here's a motion picture one with her and Eddie and the Aww. baby. And I, I think they were always really kind of, you know, like you said she was kind of that sweetheart, but then she family is everything. And she brought that front and center too, which I think they love from a publicity perspective. Absolutely. And MGM, they were the wealthiest studio. They were the most powerful studio. I mean, they survived a lot of really rough years in the Great Depression and actually came out ahead. So they really, uh, what amazes me about a lot of these studio chiefs is that many of them did not have a lot of formal education. A lot of them came from very rough, hard, hard working class backgrounds where they're, you know, I mean, selling tin or junk or, you know what I mean? Selling fur or whatever it is they did, mm -hmm. but yeah. they had, it's like they had their finger on the pulse of what America wanted to see. And they just had this sense of uh, which star, which actor or actress would be a huge star, what script would make a great movie. They almost had such an incredible way of being able to make those decisions and sense what was in the air. I think the silent era, you had more of the experimenting. And then once you get into kind of the MGM era, it was about the business. And they kind of figured out the business perspective of it versus, you know, just this craft and this creative thing that we're just trying to figure out. When they came in, it's like they knew how to create this into a business. And that's a lot of the other studios, you know, I mean, that's how Paramount kind of built as big as they did because MGM came out with Ben-Hur and they knew how to really market that and, and build up this big studio and this big business that all the other small studios like Paramount was so tiny at that time. They're like, well, we had to catch up and now we had to build these big elaborate studios. Um, so MGM was kind of the first just creating a big studio, even just from a, you know, a real estate perspective. And one of my favorite, I'm sorry, Smith, what? Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I feel like it's one thing that MGM was so prolific in its publicity. I mean, you would see their stars everywhere, but I think they were also so smart in personality building. They really created that per very specific perception of each of their stars and how they wanted them to be viewed and what kind of vehicles they would star them in and who they would star opposite. And I think with Greer and Debbie specifically, MGM hit it out of the park as far as their public perception. Both of them had very distinct public perceptions and they were cast in all the right movies. And you definitely can't say that about all of the stars back then. I think, but we would say it in today's parlance, we would say they knew their brand. Mm -hmm, exactly. I don't think that would have been a phrase in like 1940, but I think that's what they were doing you know so true I mean Greer got some of the best parts of in those years as we mentioned and Debbie really did too she was able to show all of her acting talents through the course of her career her singing her dancing her acting absolutely in some of those those stronger roles like the catered affair definitely and I, it just amazes me what they built. And one of the things I love, sometimes I go down rabbit holes on YouTube mm -hmm. and I love that behind the scenes at MGM and it's like a silent movie where 
they're showing you the lot and they show you all the cameramen cranking the cameras and they take you into the wardrobe department and there's Arte designing on a very young starlet called Lucille Lesseur, who will go on to be, of course, Joan Crawford. And then you see the fan mail department and then you see the glass structures where they shot silence. And then they go down the line of all the stars and a lot of them are hamming it up and waving. And Lon Chaney just kind of turns his back and is animated and talking away from the camera, which Chaney being Chaney, it was great because it was mysterious and yet he's the one you wanted to know the most about. So for any of you watching, if you want to go on YouTube, some of those little behind the scenes at MGM, those are just gold in terms of looking at the studio a lot. I haven't seen that one, but that's that sounds so excellent. I love the ones, I love watching the little sort of newsreel type ones where they yeah. would talk about the new stars. Like, I believe I've seen one from around the early 40s that was just introducing Esther Williams and just introducing Donna Reed. And I truly can't imagine <laughs> them being new to the scene. You know what I mean? But it's so fascinating. Yeah. And that's what these studios, and a lot of these were like such a training ground, as we mentioned, with all the teaching them to sing and dance, like a lot, a lot of those Andy Hardy movies, it's kind of amazing how many incredible actresses started out with like the love interest with Andy Hardy, you know, that was kind of like a testing ground for them to sort of, you know, prove their mettle, if you will. Mm -hmm. So many great actresses came out of that series. Definitely. And then you go into the musicals and, you know, you mm. just can't deny an MGM musical. I mean, MGM is classic movies. <laughs> it really, really defines what that is. And do you, I, I take it you guys have probably seen the That's Entertainment series. It yes. always, it's fun to watch it, but it always makes me sad because you see the empty pool where Esther used to swim and you, you see the dilapidated train station that like Fred Astaire, one of them is standing in front. It's almost like they're standing in the ruins of what was once a great empire, you know, and something about it is, is fascinating, but it's also a little sad, you know? Definitely. And I think Sony is now the one that owns the MGM lot and, oh, and they don't really like, do anything for like to promote it or anything no. to my knowledge. It's also very regretful seeing Peter Lawford's bowl cut when you watch that entertainment. Oh, Years ago, I took the Sony tour just to do it and almost marry a word about MGM. The whole thing is about Will Smith and Tom Cruise um, oh whatever, and Adam Sandler. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I want to talk about Gene Harlow and Greta Garbo and Norma Shearer and John Crawford. And I clearly was not the audience for this particular tour, but it's kind of like the elephant in the room, like it's everywhere and they don't acknowledge it. You know, it was, it was so frustrating. It really is frustrating. That's definitely one of the studios that I would be the most curious about and that I would love to tour the most. I mean, I, there are definitely studios that do a good job. I know the Warner Brothers now has a specifically classic tour, and I remember seeing a lot of really amazing costumes from them and sets from them, but MGM needs to step it up or lack thereof. <laughs> Someone needs to step it up for MGM. <laughs> Well, I think too, some of the studios are a lot more user friendly with their tours than others. Like I know that around the time 9-11 happened, sometimes I would have to go to a studio for work or wherever. And there's, it was so strict to get in the gates, which used to be before that, it wasn't nearly as hard to do. And even I remember going to a lot one day and they would take mirrors on sticks and stick them all under your car. They'd search your car. I mean, it was a big deal to even set foot on a lot. So a lot of them shut down tours after 9-11 and then COVID came along and a lot of them shut down tours on COVID. So it's, it seems like every once in a while, something terrible, catastrophic might happen and all the tours kind of fall by the wayside because they're just not as big of a priority of the studio, I guess. And then also if there's security concerns, there's also, I don't know, but you're right. Warner Brothers, I think is probably the best one in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, really honoring that history and, um, I took the Universal tour like over 20 years ago, but I really don't remember at this point. I mean, I think Universal has a little sprinkling. Universal really wasn't as big of a studio in those early days that we're talking about. I mean, uh, there are some fantastic Universal films. You know, of course, we've got the Universal horror and the, the films of the late 40s that I love, like with Anne Blythe. But 
I, something about MGM. I think a lot of those bigger, the huge studios don't have the really good tours. Yeah, I agree. It's funny, this friend of mine got married several years ago in Culver City and she had a reception or, no, it wasn't a reception, it was like an engagement party. Anyway, she had it at this condo complex in Culver City and it was, we're sitting outdoors. There's a big pond in the middle of the condo. And she turned to me and she goes, you know where we're at, don't you? And I go, yeah, Culver City. She goes, this used to be the MGM lot and they cut it up and turned it into condos. And this was the lake where they shot, you know, showboat. And I was like, oh my God, no, it's a condo complex. Like how sad is that? But or where the part of Culver City where they had the big stair hike that you can do, like King Kong was filmed over there. You know, they have like a little plaque over in that kind of section of Culver City with some of the movies that they had filmed there too. And it's just like, yeah, you go around Culver City, you find these little pockets of historical spots that you just never thought would be there you know to, to you know today's standards of how it's built up yeah and one thing I do think is also fun to see the MGM lot I love Marion Davies and if you see show people which I'm assuming you guys have both seen mm -hmm. um, and show I haven't people. yet I'm very new to Marion Davies actually a world of magic awaits you Samantha <laughs> hilarious I've only seen her in five and ten I believe with you Leslie Howard Georgia who moves to Hollywood which I can relate to that and the first shot of the movie is down Hollywood Boulevard. They're driving down it in 1928. And then she gets a job at MGM. And like, the, I don't think it says that, but the whole movie, she's on the MGM lot. And Fairbanks has a bit part in it as an extra. Charlie Chaplin's an extra, like Carl Dane, John Gilbert. Wow. You'll, you'll have a field day spotting all the silent stars. And you get a lot of great shots of the studio. And it's about a lady... I don't want to spoil all of it, but she starts out doing comedy, but then she gets to be a big star and she becomes kind of on her high horse, if you will, and thinks she's like this diva and kind of shuns all of her old friends. And then she gets a little comeuppance. So um, it's hysterical. It's laugh out loud funny. It's such a Valentine to silent film comedy and also just the studio world there's like a commissary scene where it pans down the row and the commissary and that's I nerd out about it that stuff so I'd be so work. excited yeah I think oh. Doug Fairbanks is in there and yeah it reminds me of the extra girl too with Mabel Norman like they both kind of play that same role this new girl coming and trying to make it into the studios and yeah they're just it's hilarious yeah, it's one. Of, it's, it's such a treasure of a movie. So please let me know when you've seen it because we'll talk. It's so definitely. Good. Our friend uh, Lara Gabriel, she has written the definitive book on Marion Davies. She spent a decade writing it, and it comes out in September. So I'm very so excited. exciting. Very excited about that. Another great MGM movie about movie making, of course, would be The Bad and the Beautiful. Which okay. I've probably seen like six times, but it's another one that kind of gives you a little glimpse into studio life. And of course, made at MGM with Lana Turner and Dick Powell and Kirk Douglas and of course, Vincent Minnelli. And that's another really good film about film and about the studio world. I adore that one. It has a great cast. I, I love Lana and what she brought to the screen in that role. And, and I actually do think Kirk Douglas is a really great actor. I know he's not super well loved in the old Hollywood community for, for some reasons. But for me, when we're talking about Hollywood films about Hollywood and specifically MGM, I think the big one for me is the 37 A Star is Born. I am so partial to that film. I love Janet Gaynor. I love the Technicolor. I love all the little things that you see, the behind the scenes moments. I think it's so great. And it really does. I mean, just as we're talking about talking, talk about building a star. It's true. Mm -hmm. It's true. Um, Angie, what are some of your favorite movies about movie making? Oh gosh, the tough one. And I agree. I think, um, Showgirls is, or uh, Show People is just fabulous. You know, I think that's always one of my favorite ones. But, you know, I still, it's hard because nowadays you're getting into the contemporary modern ones where they're trying to do the same thing again, whether it's, you know, the Hollywood series that they did or we have what the Babylon one coming up at the end of the year. And it, it's, I think they still take that same fascination of just trying to get people interested you know, into what Hollywood is. So even if, nowadays, you don't get their facts 
quite the way they should. It, it's still just kind of, I mean, recently I just was kind of watching through um, The Last Tycoon, which was um, in the 70s with Robin De Niro, but same thing, you know, they're trying to create what it was like working in these studios. I mean, it's one of those, you know, type of stories I think will never go away. And it's always going to go back to that kind of that creating the old Hollywood and the feel of the studios. And Last Tycoon kind of cracks me up because, you know, Robert De Niro is trying to play Irving Thalberg, you know, in a kind of a sense, but they're on a Paramount lot, you know, as they're kind of doing a lot of the different things, you can see certain spots in the Paramount lot jump at, yeah. But, you know, I, I think every time one of those comes out, I just can't help but watch it. I, it really does kind of, whether the, the stories are true or not, it, it just gives you that perception of what it was like being on the studios. Even Sunset Boulevard, you know, where she's being a screenwriter and, you know, the life's That's another great example. You don't think about that as kind of the, the ins and outs of a, you know, but they're fun. You know, a while back, I watched The Day of the Locust again, and that is a wild movie. Oh my gosh. It's um, kind of really fascinating just about um, the nature of fame, the sort of the feeding frenzy that, that happens um, to people in the industry, the people that are striving in the industry. That's, that's a really trippy movie. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a really trippy. And um, of course, Singing in the Rain, too, that's yet another example of the and what I find kind of fun about that is the cinematographer for Singing in the Rain was Harold Rawson, who's at Hollywood Forever. And also he was a silent film cinematographer. He shot tons of silent movies, shot tons of Harlow movies. So I kind of watched that when I watched Singing in the Rain thinking, okay, well, this was shot by someone who was there. And right. they know what it was like to transition from silence to sound and from black and white to color. And so that's fun. And then also Bombshell with Gene Harlow, which is about Hollywood, which also Harold Rawson shot. I don't know. I always play these little six degrees of separation kind of games in my head, you know, of who shot what and why and where they were at the time. And those are both really interesting kind of little parallels. Absolutely. I mean, I, anything with Gene Harlow, I just jump on. I love Bombshell. That is another really great one. It definitely um, deals with the strain that stars are under really well. I think that's one of the strengths of that movie. And, and Gene is incredible. In it. Oh, yeah. And it's a comedy. And yet, in her life, it really wasn't so funny. Right. So kind of this weirdness. The family life. and yeah, family taking advantage of you. And yeah. Yeah. Like on screen, it's hilarious. In life, it was... It was pretty tragic, actually. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a while back, UCLA Archive did a series of movies about movies, and that was fun. And one of the movies that I discovered in that series was called, I think it was the best little show on earth. It was Peter Sellers, and it was a British movie. And there's a couple who um, the girl inherits an old silent movie palace with three crusty senior citizens who fight all the time running it and she's all mad because she inherited it and I'm like that's like my dream and she and the boyfriend are like oh what do we do with all this and I was like but they they finally decide to try to run the theater and live in the apartment above the theater it's a really fun little gen if you've never seen it I think it's called the smallest show on earth actually but definitely movies about movies are a lot of fun <laughs> They're kind of a guilty pleasure, you know, because they're just sometimes they're so bad they're good. <laughs> they're good. And <laughs> sometimes there's a part of me that has to remove myself because if I get too wound up, I'll be like, well, that's not accurate. And they didn't do that. And that, and then it takes me out of it and then it drives me nuts. So like when I watched Feud, I had to just be like, okay, mm -hmm. I just let this be entertained. <laughs> I couldn't watch the Ryan Murphy Hollywood series. Though. I just, I read reviews and I just decided I had to sit that one out. But. I haven't either. I think when you touch Anna Mae Wong, I think that's where I draw the line. Because <laughs> I adore her and I don't want to see her portrayed badly at all. Um, but I agree. It's really the modern ones that I kind of feel that way about. Like my week with Marilyn, I agree. Like I've seen The Prince and the Showgirl so many times that I watched that film and they kind of redo it, you know, the behind the scenes filming it or whatever. And it, I notice all of the differences and things where maybe they should have put a little more thought and I could definitely come up with a million modern movies like that. <laughs> 
it's like you almost now they're doing a biopic educate the people <laughs> you know you have to watch it so you know what people are talking about when they get their facts wrong you know and so sometimes you have to force yourself to sit through it <laughs> well that's another thing too like um for example i loved the artist that came out in 2012. i love that movie now i know there were some fashion or music things that weren't quite you know on point but my attitude was hey silent films were all over the news more so than they had been in eternity and people were talking about them and then a silent film in like 2012 or maybe it was 2010 anyway wins best picture i was like you know if even a handful of people were like hey i want to learn about silent movies i'm going to watch sunrise or chaplin or whatever if one person even did that that movie did its job like that was kind of my attitude for it you know I definitely agree. I look at some of the remakes that have been done recently and think the same thing. I mean, of course, I'm I'm such a huge Tyrone Power fan. He's my favorite actor. And then they went and did Nightmare Alley. And I, I wanted so desperately for Tyrone to be nominated for Best Actor or for that movie to be nominated for Best Picture. And here it's remade and it's nominated for Best Picture. So it's it's a tough pill to swallow thinking about, you know, I wish that it, I, I hope that it brings more attention to, to Ty and what his contributions were to cinema, you know? Yeah, and I, I mean, I talk about this on my tour, I don't know if you've taken my tour yet, but I always say, I think he's one of the most underrated actors. He really I is. I know, because the first time I saw Nightmare Alley, I was so lucky. I got to see a nitrate print of it in 2005 at the UCLA Archive. I don't even drink anymore. And I felt so freaking drunk. I went out to my car and I'm like, I can't even drive right now. I just got to sit here. I sat in the parking lot for like ever because my mind was so blown by that movie and by him, you know, and I was just hypnotized. So the minute it became available on DVD, which took a long time, mm -hmm. I was so excited. And I just think like you never hear him talked about in the same breath as some of his contemporaries. He was never Oscar nominated. He just doesn't, I don't think he gets the respect necessarily as an actor he deserves. And I think he was so much more than the swashbuckling matinee idol that he kind of was sold as, you know? That honestly couldn't be more true. I, I think Nightmare Alley is the perfect example of that too. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to like the remake. I really wanted to give it a shot. It did not work for me. But I, the production design and sets and costumes were beautiful. But I was, I was just like, I'm just glad costumes. they admitted though to making a different perspective of the story though. You know, and that's mm -hmm. what they came out right away to say. You know, they they didn't watch the original. They went right to the book first and created a script what their envision or their thought of that book was there's the subtle differences at least that you know it, it's still the same story but it's got a lot of differences to it which I at least appreciate you know that you're not making such a remake that you're trying to create the same story when you had the greatest actors then doing it you're creating a whole different story you know based off the book which you know that's the one thing I would give them credit for and appreciating is they did make it off their own perspective at least that is true I think the one positive that I'll give to the remake is that it definitely, and, and with the exception of the, the Xena character, I think it definitely blows up the roles of both women a lot, both Molly and the, the therapist role. So I think for those reasons, I, I like it. I think there, there are some really strong female dynamic performances in the remake. Um, and you go into everybody's motivations a lot more, but I mean, I'm so partial to the original and I love the black and white and Joan Blondell. I mean, there are so many things I love about that film. Well, we're getting some comments. So let me read what people are saying. Love the images of Greer in the lion's roar from Leslie Apple. Um, let's see. Alicia Mayer, who is a relative of Louis B. Mayer, posted the 1925 tour of MGM on YouTube. Okay, so everybody go watch that later. Uh, Crystal Lawler's reminding me of this. Um, Lana, we need a Lana Hollywood kitchen. Crystal Lawler, I'm working on that. I'm totally working on that, actually. Um, considering my tiny kitchen and my lack of air conditioning in part of my apartment, 
I was thinking of futzing it and instead of doing one of Lana's actual recipes, we're doing a milkshake episode since she was reportedly discovered at a soda shop. So I'm tinkering with that as a more summary thing that I can make without my whole kitchen being like 350. So um, stay tuned. There's a really adorable scene from Slightly Dangerous, which is my favorite Lana film, where she makes a banana split blindfolded. And I think that might be fun. <laughs> oh my gosh, that would be wonderful. And by the way, Samantha, um, I found a Tyrone Thanksgiving stuffing recipe. So I have seen I, that one. Yeah, I think a Tyrone Thanksgiving is be a, a really good thing. I def when I make Thanksgiving dinners, pretty much every single recipe is an old Hollywood recipe. Um, aside from I think the meat, basically. Um, well, I could find a meat recipe if I wanted to, but um, I always do Doris Day's stuffed potatoes. I do Lucille Ball's cranberry sauce, which is one of my all-time favorite old Hollywood oh. recipes. Marilyn Monroe's stuffing. I um, did that one. It. And then, and then for breakfast, I usually do Ann Baxter's uh, Swiss quiche. I had trouble with Marilyn Monroe stuffing, to be honest. Um, I burned it. I did too. You did too. <laughs> I did too. I used a very shallow dish though. Like the dish was only like this. Um, it was long and thin, but I burned it. I, I definitely burned it. <laughs> but the ingredients are great. The ingredients are there. Yeah, it was funny when I made that one. I just got so it burned. I got so upset. And I left my friend this long voicemail about having a Marilyn Monroe crisis over her stuffing. And my friend called me back and she's like, that is the funniest voicemail you've ever left. <laughs> I was like, I'm having a crisis over Marilyn's stuff. I can't uh, let's see. Um, bombshell is fabulous and fun. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, if anybody else has questions, feel free to ask us. But um, well, for the Lana Turner lovers, so I pulled out one of my MGM uh, lobby card books, and there's a gorgeous. Oh, that's beautiful. Let's look at some MGM lobby cards, Angie. I'm down for that. Yes. I think Lana is very underrated as an actress too. I completely I've, agree. I've talked about this many times on Hollywood Kitchen, even with, with uh, Victor Matura and his daughter. I think that some of the ones that were super, super beautiful, I think people just kind of focused on, oh, and they're so pretty. And it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. they have more to offer than that. I think Lana Turner, Jean Tierney, Tyrone, Victor Matura, I think a lot of them were kind of just not taken as seriously as they deserve to be as, as actors. I would even say Marilyn is a perfect yeah, example. Ava Gardner, I think yeah. of for sure. Um, I think a lot of them too, because I've talked really in depth about Jean Tierney and and her her mental struggles, and it's like maybe part of it is because nobody gave her the appreciation she deserved, you know. So it really really did a number on their mental well being too. When you see a movie like Bombshell, it definitely addresses it. It's funny, I think we live in a world where people assume being rich or famous is like the answer to all of your problems, which it's totally mm -hmm. not. And people, even in that position, they have problems too. They might look a little different than mine or yours, but they have them. And uh, yeah, I think I think the situation with Jean Tierney and her baby and everything that we'll, we'll do a whole other episode on Jean Tierney. I'm already working mm -hmm. on a plan for one eventually. But yeah, I think she really is underrated as well. Let's see some more lobby card in. Lobby card in. <laughs> I was trying to find some uh, Debbie Reynolds ones. So here, like, here's one from the fairs of Dobie Gills. Kind of some of her unheard of, probably. <laughs> There's um, Love that one. with Jane Powell and Debbie Reynolds. And let's see, The Great Waltz, again, Louise Reiner with her MGM stories. Uh, what's this one? I just love how again they just they did so much with their full cast, you know, and, and they just really kind of brought all of them together. Um, here's um speaking of Marilyn Monroe, there's no business like show business. Oh, that's such a fun wow. One. See that one was signed what by Mitzi, I believe. Yeah, Mitzi Gaynor. Um let's see, that's Toy Such and Fox. There's a few extras in there. Um those are gorgeous. I, I will say too, I have I have a few Debbie posters in my collection also. I have a insert of Tammy and the Bachelor. I they're so big it would be a little difficult to get all of them out, but 
I have an insert of Tammy and the Bachelor. I have a one sheet of Bundle of Joy and the Mating Game. So I kind of have a mini Debbie collection going on. I also have a pair of her earrings that I got from the Debbie and Carrie Fisher sale um, after they passed away. And, um, and, and I did mention earlier that, that I wrote her a letter before she passed and she sent me like a signed photo back. And that's part of the part of the handwriting from the photo that I want to get tattooed. So I have a cool story about them. Um, of course, it was devastating when they both died back to back like that. And Absolutely. I was born in the 70s. And for me as a little girl, like Princess Leia and Wonder Woman were like the only two women in pop culture that were strong, that were powerful, that I remember idolizing. And when Carrie Fisher died, I was, it was just devastating. I mean, mm -hmm. 2016 was a horrendous year for so many reasons, but then to top it off with Carrie and Debbie back to back. Well, then two friends of mine from Italy came to visit Los Angeles and I took them to see Debbie and Carrie's grave at Forest Lawn Hollywood Hills. And it was kind of a coolish rainy morning. And my friend Tamada touched my arm and said, Carrie, Carrie, look. And I turned around, there were two rainbows in the sky, like oh, that man. over Debbie and Carrie. And I just, I just got goosebumps over every inch of my body. And we all just stood there in silence for like a long time. It was just, I'll never forget that moment. It was really beautiful. On those that still want Debbie, went, you know, bringing up Todd, um, Fisher it, on his Facebook page, maybe Samantha, you get their Facebook page right. It's is it like the Debbie Reynolds store or something? They have a Facebook page and periodically they'll put up Debbie Reynolds personal clothes and, and jewelry and things that you know fans can still purchase, you know, through. But an interesting story um, when you mentioned that, um, the fact that she's Carrie Fisher's mom. I had met with the gentleman that put on the 1981 Mary Pickford auction. And he always had a hard time because not only was Debbie Reynolds big in preservation, but so was Jane Withers. And they actually would bid against each other. And so, so many times wow. he tried getting the two ladies, just you guys had the same cause, like quit bidding against each other and, and you know, do it together. But one day he had to have Debbie Reynolds come over to his home and he had a young son at that time and he had gone up to her and he's like, who are you? And, and she's like, well, you know what, know who I am, but I'm, you know, and the mother of <laughs> um, Princess Leia. And it was just like, she was just so modest about it. It was just such an adorable story, but you know, it, it, that she really did kind of own that, you know, Carrie Fisher, the kids really kind of took the, you know, the stick and ran with it. And one of the images that gutted me was um, someone did an artwork and it was Princess Leia with the buns on her hair and the white robe. And you just see her from the back walking. And then you see Debbie with her singing in the rain, yellow mm -hmm. poncho, and they're walking together that. into the sunset. And I was like, oh God, <laughs> like that just gutted me. Debbie's was definitely the hardest movie star death that I've experienced. It, it, it was awful. I was, I was a mess. Sydney Poitier came pretty, pretty close. <laughs> one of my friends, when Olivia de Havilland died, one of my friends was like, why are you so upset? She was well over a hundred, Carrie. I mean, how can this be surprising to you? And I said, here's the thing. When you've grown up watching this person your whole life, they're not just a movie star. They're like a presence in your life. Mm -hmm. They touch you in some profound way. And just knowing they exist in the world is kind of comforting. And then when I they feel very die, grateful for it too, that I'm able to share the planet with some of them. <laughs> yeah. And then when they don't exist or they're not with us any longer, you just feel like there's this gaping hole in your universe. Even if you didn't know them personally, it's like. So you feel like you know them through their movies. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's sad too, because you're losing the stories. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. we love having Cora Sue with us because we could still hear these stories, you know, and I think that's what we kind of hold on to these, you know, last few of the um, kind of the studio dynamic is, you know, once they're all gone, the stories are gone and it's all hearsay and we're trying to put pieces together. And, you know, that's always a hard part is, is the loss of the stories. Someone on my cemetery tour told me once they said, Every time a person dies, it's like a library burns to the ground. Mm -hmm. I was like, that is seriously, that is so profound. That kind of stayed with me when they said that. And 
Yeah, I mean, that's why I think it's so important to tell these stories, to share these people, share their work, and keep this stuff alive. I honestly think sharing the recipes too is a huge part of it for me. I feel so much closer to that person when I make something that they might have eaten or might have enjoyed making for other people. Yeah, I feel so like that's definitely a huge part of why I love doing this. Almost every time I do one of these, I don't know if both because both of you guys have made, made a lot of celebrity recipes way more than me. I get people contacting me almost every time going, hello, Carrie, you know they probably didn't make this. And I'm always go. Okay, Vincent Price and Joan Crawford, I'm pretty sure they did. And even if they didn't, the fact is it's a way to talk about them. It's a way to connect with them. It's a jumping off point. And I still enjoy it, even if Norma Shearer didn't know where the kitchen was in her home, which might be likely. I have still enjoyed making recipes attributed to her. So, And if the, even if they didn't make it, you know, those recipes were of that time. You know, so you're walking in the shoes of that time, you know, and you're learning about, you know, some of these little additives that we don't use in today's standards, but they did then. And it just, you know, puts you in that time period. And studios were so controlling of every single thing that they sent out into the public that I feel like a lot of these recipes are an extension of the star's personality, if nothing else. You know, like, I don't know if Debbie made this guacamole, but I think she was the person, kind of person that liked guacamole. <laughs> at least, you know, I think that's probably why they were, like, associated, at least. Or a lot of the Betty Davis recipes are kind of very New England-themed, which makes sense because she was a New Englander. Like, there's some things you can go, well, okay, I totally believe that, you know, they would have made that. And I and love so it. Oh, I was just going to say, it's so funny when you find out that there's a star that's horrible outside of the kitchen or in the kitchen. Like Barbara Eden was on Worst Cooks of America, but there are Barbara Eden recipes around. And June Allison was a horrible cook also, but there are June Allison recipes around. So when I announced funny. I was going to do this, um, someone sent me an email and they said, Carrie, there's footage of Debbie Reynolds on TV with Dinah Shore talking about guacamole and making it. I was like, Oh, that's proof right there so you that know. is so cool yeah. but angie i love all the mary pickford recipes um samantha i don't know if you know angie has all the original recipes from the head chef of pixar oh my goodness that's amazing yeah. Well, yeah, I haven't been able to do a lot of other people's recipes because I'm trying to get through them all so I can make it into a book. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the one advantage of living here in Los Angeles and, and going to the estate sales. That's the one thing we try to go for, too, is, um, you know, their family recipe books. You know, it's like we went to Walter Lane, the director, um, estate sale, and I went right for his family recipe book. And if they made it know, but his wife was actually Carol Lombard's assistant. And there's a lot of notations in there, like, oh, Car like there's a great fudge chocolate. It's like anytime I make a cake or something that needs like a chocolate frosting, I always use this one because she put Carol's boyfriend, you know, this is Carol's favorite chocolate, you know. And Chris actually mentioned that last night when we were kind of getting prepped and things. He's like, you do notice a difference when we take our actual recipes we get from their home and make it and it just tastes amazing versus some of the magazine ones where you're like eh, I don't think I would ever make that again but when you really dive into their like the the pick fair recipes I mean the, the food is just I mean you had the best French chefs there you had everything and, and the food is just amazing when you make it and it's just but yeah like that chocolate fudge is just to die for and um so yeah well we went to um with Barbara Rush's estate sale too same thing we went and got a recipe you know it's just it's fun because again it's it's the same thing though you know with the, the magazine ones because it's putting in that that time in that era but it's it just kind of neat to see their hand notes and stuff with it and... I would love to make that Carol Lombard chocolate recipe because uh, when I did the Lombard episode this past January I found several recipes attributed to her but one of them was like oysters and I just finally landed on the cherry tart but then I made it and it burned and it looked awful. And I texted a friend and she's like, wow, you really burned that pizza, Carrie. And I'm like, it wasn't <laughs> pizza, it was a cherry tart. And I, I had all sorts of trouble. So then I wound up making a cherry palfatis or however you pronounce that, which is like a sort of a cherry tart, but different. And anyway, I, I would love to find a really 
Oh, I like to see Carol just sitting there eating chocolate right off a spoon. You know, that, that would be totally your character. <laughs> I found probably one of just look, I never actually made it, but just looking at it, one of the worst celebrity recipes I've ever seen was a Carol Lombard recipe. It was lettuce soup. Yes, and it that's was, what I was looking at. Yeah. <laughs> literally lettuce boiled in water and pretty much nothing else. And it just, I was like, that's the Great Depression right there. <laughs> That ending up in a magazine or something. Barbecue spare ribs, angels on horseback, Mm -hmm. whatever that is, like an oyster thing, and then lettuce soup, and then the cherry tart sounded the most appealing out of all those other options, so. I could see you eating the angels on bareback, because usually it's got, like, bacon, you know, it's usually not the most, it's, like, usually oysters wrapped in something not healthy, so I could probably see her having fun eating something like that, but she just seems... Especially being up in the valley, I could have just seen her eating just the most scariest things. She doesn't seem like much of a chef to me. She seems more of like the type to like bring you a chicken from her farm. Like, I don't know what to do with this. You might know what to do with this. <laughs> when I did the Oscar couple on the year before last, uh, Christina Rice, the Anne Dvorak biographer, she named her daughter Gable. And they asked me, they said, can you send us any Clark Gable recipes? And I sent her a bunch, and they're all like the hunter's breakfast. Yes, they're I've all seen that one. beef. And Christina's like, you know, we're vegetarians, right? I'm like, okay. So then I found um, a Gable sour cream chocolate cake, and they mm. loved it so much they made it for Gable's birthday. So Gable ate a Gable recipe, which was kind of fun. That is so cute. I know I've made his pancakes also, but I didn't really like them. <laughs> it was like some kind of like a wheat mixture. It was, it was strange. So what are some of the, like, cause I love talking to you guys about the recipes you've made. Like what is the absolute best one that you've made so far of the Hollywood star recipes and then the worst? Angie, we'll go first. Oh, um, well, like I said, I, th- I think it would go back to some of the personal ones um, from our pick fair one. I mean, you know, we grew up in the Midwest, so it was always a turkey Thanksgiving um, dinner. But when we started going through the pick fair ones, the duck was just amazing. So that's kind of one of our traditions now is we make the pick fair duck recipe for every Thanksgiving. And um, and the other one, too, that we learned from that is um, chicken a la king. And that's um, just one of our rotations. Every few weeks, we make our chicken a la king from Pick Fair. It's, it's just, you know, those two things, again, just, you knew it was done by a very good chef that created these recipes, and they're just absolutely amazing. What's the worst one you've done? Anything with sweet bread, because um, I personally tried to make it, and I have to have Chris do it next time. You know, I just, I think because I'm the one that made it mentally, I was making it. So it could have been fabulous, but because I made it and smelled it and did the whole process. And then, you know, I went to Mousson Franks and had it. I'm like, oh, this is great. It does not remind me of what I made. Um, So I have to have him try it sometime. But yeah, I I think it was just more mental. (laughs) You know my story about sweet bread? What's that? When I first started making these recipes, I looked up one. And again, I didn't know much about cooking until I started this whole project. But it said, soak the sweet bread under water. And I called a friend and who is a much better cook than me. And I asked her and I go, well, this is good. The bread's going to fall apart if I do that. And there's this oh, long yeah. silence. And she's like, Carrie, honey. Just skip that one. <laughs> bread is. And I go, it's bread that's sweet. She's like, no, it's not, Carrie. <laughs> Which explained to me it was cow intestines. I was like, oh, oh I would say next time you go to Mousson Franks, if you just wanted to try it, that would probably be the best place to try it. Because you know, they probably get the best of it. And <laughs> Samantha, what's the best and the worst for you of the celebrity recipe? So I'm going to start with the worst because it ties right into all of this. Um talking about just the mental experience of making a recipe. Uh when I made Boris Karloff's steak and kidney pie, it So I will say it took me five hours to make the pie. And a huge part of it was because I used beef kidneys and I had never worked with them before and taking out all the channels, like the sort of like white in between parts was just brutal. And it smelled so bad. I just never want to relive that experience. I will say 
the pie was incredible with the exception of the kidneys. So if I made that again with just the steak and the vegetables and the lattice crust, I think it would be incredible, but I'm never going near kidneys again. <laughs> I don't get why people eat kidneys because kidneys are basically what filters out waste from your body. So why would one mm -hmm. eat that? I mean, I, I'm from the South, so chicken livers was a thing, but. Me too, but I never ate those as a kid, but I do remember them being. I liked them, and I like the livers in Marilyn Monroe's stuffing recipe also. I think that's a good addition, but this was just, just the raw dealing with it was, was horrible. It was not a fun experience. But someone I would say ate it for you, and it could have been good, but the fact you had to do it yourself. The smell, I am never going to get out of my nose. I'm never going to forget it, so I just can't even like think about the smell without like, I'm kind of squeamish so I, there's mm -hmm. certain things certain organs and certain things I've got to sidestep in this world I'm a, I'm a ninny I can't help that I'm usually pretty good but but this one just set it off for me um I would definitely say my best in my opinion is Elizabeth Taylor's chicken with avocado and mushrooms you mentioned that one yes that's it did good. yeah that that's definitely my favorite I think it's so good I used a Cornish game hen because um, in the recipe, she asked for, I believe, a two and a half pound chicken. And I just could not find that in my grocery store. They don't come that small anymore. <laughs> so it's, it's always like the big like butterball or, or whatever chickens. And um, so I used a game hen and it just was so rich and luxurious. It was like the best thing ever. <laughs> One of the best home cooked meals I've ever made for sure. But there are so many that are always in my rotation. Um, Lucille Ball's cranberry sauce. I make every Thanksgiving. I brag about it to people. <laughs> um, Joan Blondell has a really good like Sunday supper casserole type dish that's really good. I make that um, all the time. Um, so those are a couple other favorites. Right. I think my one of my personal favorites. Um, I at Thanksgiving I got kind of tired of doing the conventional pies, even though those are fun. So I made Catherine Hepburn's brownies and I threw in a bunch of fresh cranberries into the chocolate and then I baked it and the cranberries burst. So that dark chocolate brownie and that burst cranberry, that was absolutely a triumph. And I barely, barely brag about my cooking ever, but that was like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. Catherine Hepburn's brownies are, are also in my rotation. That is my go-to brownie recipe. Oh, and I have to give some props to Pearl Bailey. Anything she anything she's made in any of her cookbooks are my favorite. Her mac and cheese specifically is so good. <laughs> that's so awesome. And then I think my worst one, that's hard because I've screwed up a lot. And, <laughs> oh boy, jeez. I think really honestly, and I recently addressed this on a separate issue, um, a show episode, but the first time I made Dean Martin's burgundy chicken, it was an outright disaster. And I almost canceled the whole episode. But then I'm like, well, I promised Rick, I've got to follow through. And then I thought it's a Jerry Lewis Dean Martin episode. It's okay to admit to total disaster. In fact, it's on brand. So I kind of just, what they would call leaned into it today and just held it up and was like, I screwed up and I'm sorry. So then I did a redo episode when Rick's book recently came out about them. And I had my friend Ruth Munsack come up and she kind of course corrected me because after that burgundy episode to chicken burgundy, Ruth texted me and she's like, what in the heck went wrong there, Carrie? And I texted her the recipe and she's like, this recipe is not complete. No wonder this turned out like it did. So Ruth kind of set me straight. And so I think I, I learned something. So that was, that was huge. That is so awesome. I mean, Dean Martin, anything I'll jump out. I know he has like a burger recipe and then Frank Sinatra has his burger recipe that's, that just says steal Dean Martin's burgers and drink his bourbon. And that's like so hilarious. I oh, had yeah. Catherine Hepburn's brownies before that. I agree with you. Those are pretty amazing. <laughs> Definitely my favorite brownie recipe that I've ever made. Usually I just kind of go for the, the box. I hate to admit, but uh, once I tried Catherine Hepburn's, I'm like, okay, I, I think this is so easy and so good. I'm just going to make this now. <laughs> if you want an alternative Thanksgiving recipe, I'm telling you, that is such a crowd pleaser. Like the Thanksgiving I had before the pandemic when I was in a room with lots of people, that's what I made everybody loved it and it was such a great alternative to pumpkin pie or pecan you know it was a great different kind of dessert 
trying to think of some of the desserts that I've made. I feel like I've made some pies. I, Anne Blythe's blueberry muffins is a favorite of mine for sure. Um, I tell you it's what so foolproof. Did I tell you what happened on that episode? Um, I did a kitchen episode about that one. And then um, my friend Barbara Boy Das, she wrote a letter to Anne Blythe telling her that I'd made the muffins and everything. And about the episode, and Anne Blythe wrote her a letter back and said, "Glad the recipe still works, love Anne." And I was like, "That oh, is like, so cool." That's confirmation. Vita made those muffins. Mm -hmm. So, if it's good enough for Vita, it's good enough for all of us. I used to write letters to stars, and now that I've been cooking uh, old movie star recipes as long as I have, I want to write to everybody again. At just to ask for recipes and just to get their opinions on recipes that that's something that it's definitely a goal of mine to do especially while some of them are still around yes that's a wonderful idea because i think these recipes are kind of an insight into the people mm -hmm. like when i did the favorite one i sent her daughter like probably 12 recipes and the daughter's like no to any of these she didn't make this stuff i was like fair enough you tell me what she made and that's what we do and then she sent me the caesar salad thing and i was like so it's kind of interesting that the, again, maybe it's sort of like the public persona versus who they were in private and what they did in private. And it's just, there's such a gap sometimes between those. Absolutely. And I know Jenny, who's not with us, but I, I believe the last time she was here and I had read on her blog before that, when she wrote to Rhonda Fleming while she was still alive, um, Rhonda sent her a recipe. So it was for like cowboy beans or something. And she included a picture of her with a horse and it was just too cute. I, I, I can't imagine. I was so jealous. I was like, I want some recipes sent to me my old movie stars. That's like the dream. Jenny is awesome. I, I love her and I really look forward. I'm hoping in the future, the next guacamole and some other episodes, we can get the whole squad together and get all of us, you with Angie and Samantha and Jenny and Fritzy and just have a whole session about these recipes and cooking. It's so much fun. Yeah, it's so fun. I, I love doing these. I really try to get a, a lot of old movie star recipes into my rotation. I have, you know, distant aspirations of writing a cookbook too. I kind of want to go by decade of like actresses specifically. I want to do like a volume one actresses and then go 20s through the 60s and then a volume two actors and do 20s through the 60s. Um, but, but yeah, so I, I definitely need, uh, I have a lot of recipes to work on in my future. <laughs> definitely. Well, this has been so much fun. I can't believe it's only, it's almost been two hours, you guys. So I know thank you so much for joining me. I'm glad to be back after my little hiatus here. So Angie, thank you so much. Where can people find you online if they want to follow you and find out more about your incredible collections? Yeah, so my Instagram, Facebook handles, um, you can either just follow me personally on Facebook, otherwise my handles are Tinsel and Stars. Um, and I also have a website that I keep telling myself I'll build up eventually, but I do have a tinselandstars.com, which especially from the pick for a collection, I really want to start scanning and having it be a resource website. So one day it'll get there, <laughs> but I do some blogs now and then. And thank you to you and Chris and your animal crew for joining us today. Yep, they're in the house house, so it was nice and quiet out here. <laughs> Samantha, where can people find you? Well, I have my monthly column, Cooking with the Stars, on Classic Movie Hub. I have my website, Musings of a Classic Film Addict. You can hear some of my podcast episodes on Ticklish Business, but really I'm most frequent on Twitter at Classic Film Geek. That's where you can find most of my stuff. I'm taking a little bit more of a step back from cooking and trying to do more of like the jump. I mean, of course, speaking to your, your own heart, I jump back into grave marking. So <laughs> getting a Urban lot of the diagrams stars stars. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a super fun and rewarding hobby. So I'm diving back into that. So that, that's going to be more of what I'm going to be doing uh, pretty soon. But and all you want to do is send off. Oh. <laughs> I'm out my office, so rarely ever have any any animals out here. But sometimes Ollie will make his way out here, won't you? Ollie, <laughs> Ollie, like um, yeah, Ollie. Oliver Hardy, Oliver Bean. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Ollie. I look forward to 
forward to meeting you when Angie and I do an in-person episode together. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me. Thank you everybody who's been watching and please follow these fabulous ladies because they do so much awesome work and put so much great stuff out there in the social media and to the world. And thank you so much for joining me and stay tuned for more food, fun, and film history from Hollywood Kitchen. Bye. Right, bye. Thanks for having me, Carrie.